all still together. Um, they form uh, little family groups that are really, really strong. The natives also make sure that everybody's taken care of and watching each other. They call it Oyate, meaning that it's a, a group, a band, a family. Uh, <clears throat> togetherness, unified, and they all watch out for one another. It's not more land that Mike needs, or more grass. The reservation has plenty of native grassland. Operating from the principle that buffalo are wildlife, relatives who deserve our respect rather than commodity livestock, does not mean that Mike and his crew can simply open the gates and walk away. He has struggled for decades to find a reasonable balance between allowing the herd to roam free and the 21st century needs of the tribe that require an annual roundup to doctor and cull the herd for tribal needs without harming individual animals in a poorly designed old cattle corral. With grants from ITBC, Mike has systematically replaced the old corrals with new low stress designs that will allow him to conduct the practical business of the roundup as quickly and painlessly as possible. the Lamar River Valley in Yellowstone National Park. Nowhere is the contrast between the cultural approach of Indian country and the failed policies of the past century more in conflict than the battleground of America's first national park. It's common knowledge that Yellowstone is home to the only free-roaming, genetically pure buffalo herd in the nation. It's a place where tourists can photograph a long-lost pre-Columbian world from the safety of their automobiles and trailers. But like all mythology of the American West, this common knowledge is not quite true. For at least 10,000 years, our ancestors followed the buffalo herds into these high mountain valleys. We hunted and camped on the shores of the Yellowstone Lake. Then, like the buffalo herds, we retreated back onto the plains when the first snows arrived. The ancient cycle was destroyed in less than 30 years. Not even the army or park rangers could protect the Yellowstone buffalo from poaching. By the end of the 19th century, there were only 23 buffalo left in Yellowstone. Our ancestors were forced onto the reservations. Wolves and bears were wiped out. Without natural predators, the elk population exploded. When Teddy Roosevelt stepped in to save the buffalo from extinction, the Yellowstone ecosystem was already in shreds. You know, you, you have uh, Teddy Roosevelt and you have Hornaday going out to, to basically hunt and capture animals to take back to the New York Zoo. Uh, there was no concern when they wiped out millions to, to basically put tribal people on, on reservations, you know, basically remove our whole food source to, to dominate us and, and make us do what they wanted. There, there was never a concern. There was no concern about the millions they killed. There was concern about the fact that they couldn't find a handful to take back to a zoo. That's the genesis of Yellowstone National Park. At the beginning of the 20th century, new animals from the Charles Goodnight herd in Texas and the Pablo Allard herd in Montana were introduced into the park. You know, they, they were there to serve a need for, for the public to view and non-tribal people to hunt. They were rounded up, they were culled, you know, animals were sold, they were processed. There was all these management activities that took place within that herd that 
doesn't get discussed today. So, so you have 60 years of management, almost 70 years of active management with that herd to keep the population down to 300, 400, 500. You know, it, it was actively managed to that point until, you know, the, the whole conservation era hit in the 60s. And then Yellowstone stopped managing their animals. And then you have a population go from three, 400 to three, 4,000. After 1968, park biologists slowly set about to reconstruct the Yellowstone ecosystem. Wolves and bears were reintroduced, the elk population was reduced, the overgrazed grasslands and the willow groves in hundreds of watersheds were protected. By any standard, it was a conservation miracle with three glaring problems. First of all, the wolves and bears returned, but tribal people were not allowed to return. Tribal people on this landscape, we're the apex predator. We've always been the apex predator. And when you talk about that, there, there's no concept of humans as predators. Nobody wants to see that idea, you know, and that's something that I continually remind them of is, you know, when you've created this conservation area, when you've created this park, what time frame were you trying to recreate? Well, what are you looking for? What are you trying to do? Because no matter which point in time you pick as your reference point, there would be someone like me out there wandering around. You know, I'd be starting fires, I'd be picking plants, I would be harvesting animals. You know, it's what created the healthy landscapes and ecosystems we had. This idea that you're now gonna pick a time point, recreate a place, and eliminate my role is why you have problems. The second problem was elk. When predators were killed off, the elk population exploded and spread brucellosis to the buffalo. For decades, park biologists tried to eliminate brucellosis from the buffalo herd. But as long as the elk have been allowed to roam in and out of the park without controls, it's been impossible to eradicate the disease among the buffalo. Today, Buffalo and elk exist in an uneasy balance, but once they migrate out of the park, infected elk roam free, while park buffalo, suspected of being infected with brucellosis, are rounded up and butchered. The third problem is weather and the seasonal migration of wildlife. In the old days, the herds migrated out of the high mountain valleys when the first snows arrived. Today, the buffalo are trapped inside the park. So what do they do when the snows are deep? They try to escape. By the hundreds, they move north and west each winter, right through the majestic Roosevelt Arch, onto the irrigated fields of the Yellowstone River Valley where they come into direct conflict with private ranchers and the anti brucellosis regulations of the Montana Livestock Board. For several decades, buffalo who escaped in the winter were harassed back into the park by mounted rangers and helicopters. In a tragic reenactment of the late 19th century slaughter, buffalo that did not return were routinely shot by the hundreds and then by the thousands. The annual killing was not a triumph of conservation policy, it was a public relations disaster. You know, originally you, you did have what they called the old firing lines where the Department of Livestock would authorize shooters that as soon as the bison would come out of Yellowstone, you know, they would basically just shoot every buffalo that came out. You know, that, that was the early 90s and that's what caused them to say, what other options are there? As the killings increased, ITPC member tribes offered an innovative but controversial six-point plan to capture live animals, test them for brucellosis, and transfer healthy animals to tribal herds. First, give up the fiction of a free-roaming herd and return to strict management to control population and disease. Set a carrying capacity for the park and manage the herd to its capacity. 
negotiate new policies with the state of Montana that would permit buffalo to migrate into some of the millions of acres of federal lands adjacent to the park. ITBC tribes have a unique responsibility as both relatives to the buffalo and traditional predators. Restore the treaty hunting rights for tribes who have a historical claim in Yellowstone and allow tribes to harvest animals in a modern way to supplement tribal food programs. The ecosystem cannot be made whole without our active participation in the decision-making process. The sixth proposal was the most controversial. Establish an experimental quarantine of captured buffalo that tested negative for brucellosis at the Roundup. Instead of butchering them, monitor them to determine if they can be safely released to the tribes to help build tribal herds. Is it a good thing? No, no, it's not a good thing. It's a horrible thing to have to do. Nobody wants to do it. You know, and our organization has stepped into the fray, basically saying, you know what, if there's hard decisions that need to be made and there's hard actions that need to be taken, you know, we should be responsible enough. It's our role as the relative to this animal to do that. Under the supervision of park biologists and veterinarians, the first Yellowstone quarantine experiment began in 2005. It was a grim compromise. None of us liked the idea of buffalo calves growing up in confinement corrals, being poked by veterinarians, and being penned up for years of quarantine. For us, it was all too reminiscent of being forced into boarding schools. But the ITBC proposal was clear-eyed and practical. It offered a way to keep buffalo from being killed and a way to move live Yellowstone animals into tribal herds. So really the whole quarantine thing, the way it was implemented, was a proof of concept, a scientific experiment that, that proposes that when animals test negative as calves, if they're taken to a place where they're not exposed to any infected animals, they'll remain negative. You know, they did it with three groups of animals over the course of, of three years of capturing animals, and they terminated the program. The results of the quarantine experiment were exactly as we had predicted. Not a single calf who tested negative for brucellosis at the time of capture converted to positive during the three years of quarantine. Veterinarians even concluded that for bull calves, the duration of the quarantine could be safely reduced from three years to just six months. No matter the results, the Montana livestock industry continued to oppose the transfer of surplus Yellowstone buffalo to the tribes. Four hundred miles north of Yellowstone, on the plains of northern Montana, Robbie Magnan stands a lonely vigil. He is director of fishing game for the Assiniboine and Sioux tribes of the Fort Peck Reservation, and he has made it his life work to restore buffalo to the Indian lands of the northern plains. In my imagination, this is where the Yellowstone buffalo are headed when they escape the park each winter to the wide open grasslands of Fort Peck and Fort Belknap and the other reservations in Montana. Fort Peck started its first buffalo herd in 2000. Like most tribes, the herd was used to support tribal ceremonies and a small school lunch program. When the herd could not meet tribal demands, Robbie took meat from buffalo that were butchered after escaping from Yellowstone. They would shoot them and cut them out and they'd give them to the tribes to skin. We were going down there 
every other week, getting 20, 30 at a time. And it was getting to become a bad scene. People were getting concerned. They want to start getting Buffalo back here alive instead of being dead. After Yellowstone completed its quarantine experiment, Robbie and the tribes considered the future. What if Fort Peck took up where Yellowstone left off? What if Fort Peck built its own quarantine facility to channel escaped Yellowstone animals to tribal herds? Could the tribal quarantine, managed at the highest scientific and technical standards, break the standoff with the Montana livestock industry? In the heart of the reservation, the Assiniboine and Sioux took up the challenge. They created a 320-acre quarantine in the center of their 13,000-acre wildlife refuge, capable of holding and testing 300 buffalo for as long as necessary until they could be certified disease-free and released to other tribes. It seemed like a win-win proposition. Actually, uh, IDBC has done about 90% of this to make this a possibility. Through grants, they've helped me from starting out with the exterior boundaries of these quarantine facilities to the next year following with corral systems. And this last year, or two years ago, they helped us with the watering system. The Montana Livestock Board remained skeptical. The first hurdle was to overcome the fear that animals might escape the quarantine and infect local cattle herds. So Robbie and his staff created security around security around security. And to come off Highway 13, you travel roughly three miles, and then you will run into our buffalo pasture. That there is designed with a wildlife-friendly fence. It's designed to keep cattle out, but allow other wildlife to pass to and from on this unit freely. Then once you get inside this unit, you come basically about another mile and a half, and then you run into what we call our quarantine facilities. And that quarantine facility is basically a 320-acre facility that built with eight foot woven wire. And 10 feet inside that eight foot woven wire front, we run a five wire electric fence. And that is runs on basically on 9,000 volts. And if one animal touches just one wire, they get a pretty good jolt on there. But if they touch a positive and a negative, they get a severe jolt. That basically runs all the way around this whole area, it's four miles. Against the wishes of the Montana livestock industry, the first group of healthy buffalo who had participated in the Yellowstone quarantine experiment were transferred to Fort Peck in 2012. A second group was transferred in 2014. Together, these animals formed the foundation of the tribe's cultural herd. And in just three years, they have transformed the entire ecology of the wildlife refuge. And basically, a lot of our bird populations are restoring themselves that they follow the buffalo. We've, our deer families have multiplied a lot because they're basically, they're not pressured and they get along good with the, the buffalo. We've had the University of Montana did three years of studying of buffalo and the effects they have on the habitat when you place them on here. But we have found out that the way the buffalo